Hi there, um, my name is Kean Rowan and I'd like to talk to you today about my uh, undergraduate dissertation which I've titled Courtiers, Conquistadors and Administrators, the Turbulent Early Years of the Spanish Empire. So the question I wanted to approach here was um, how to explain the sudden emergence of the Spanish Empire during the reign of Charles V, who inherited the thrones of Castile and Aragon, the two major Iberian kingdoms, um, in 1517. So Charles' success in this endeavour was by no means guaranteed. The beginning of the reign was extremely unstable, um, and I basically wanted to understand how he overcame those problems, or rather how his government overcame those problems, and the Spanish Empire that we know today in our history books emerged. So to do this, I have picked out three key topics, which I dedicated my three chapters to. The first is the Revolt of the Comuneros, 1520-1521, the Revolt of Hernán Cortés, 1519-1521, and then the third chapter was on Spanish administrative reform, which uh, took place from the 1520s onwards. To go about this, um, I decided to analyse the revolts as a sort of a process. They took place almost simultaneously, and I wanted to identify some shared influences and determine how the revolts shaped the policy of Spanish administrative reformers. Um, on sources, there's a pretty significant lack of translated primary sources for Europe. It's all still in Spanish. Um, I'm in the process of learning Spanish, but I'm not quite there yet. Um, so in the meantime, I've used diplomatic correspondence from British History Online, uh, the demands of rebel groups, widely read contemporary books, and other things like that to make up for it. Um, in terms of the books, I've used things like The Education of a Prist Christian Prince by Erasmus of Rotterdam, um, The Book of the Courtier by Baldassar Castiglioni, and uh, some of the chivalric romances. And I used these essentially to get an impression for the ideology that was going around at the court of Charles V, um, what the sort of things that people were thinking about. Uh, for America, there is a much greater range of translated sources. Um, we've got a huge amount of stuff, like the entire translated letters of Hernán Cortés. This is hundreds of pages of um, material directly from the man who conquered Mexico. Uh, additionally, there's the diary of Bernal Díaz del Castillo, who was a soldier on Cortés's expedition. And he was very useful to have because he is quite plain speaking, and Cortés often lies or tells only half the truth. And Diaz uh, has a tendency to contradict Cortez at times, so his diary reads as a good companion piece when you're reading Cortez's letters. So to move on into the content of this presentation now, um, I'm going to start with the revolt of the Comuneros, um, which essentially was a municipal revolt, meaning that it was driven by the towns of Castile, and it was driven by a very anti-foreign feeling in the towns. Um, Charles had been born in what we would now term the Netherlands, and he brought with him a bunch of Flemish courtiers. And these men were extremely unpopular. Um, there was a huge amount of nepotism and cronyism going on. These courtiers were getting all the best positions, which would traditionally go to Spanish men. Um, they were scratching each other's backs, and this alienated the nobility, first of all, and the massive tax demands that Charles wanted to supply his other European endeavours also alienated the towns. So we're in the situation now where Charles doesn't really have any supporters anywhere. Um, so obviously this led to a revolt. Um, and Charles at this point wasn't even in Spain. He was on his way to Germany um, to try to secure his election as Holy Roman Emperor, which had been a, a major concern of the common era rebels who thought they were going to have an absentee king. And they did for most of the reign. So they were validated in that fear. What ends up happening is that the nobility who see that this revolt is taking a decidedly social turn, uh, they realize that their actual place in society is at risk if they continue to support the rebels. So they turn on the rebels and they utterly crush the revolt at the Battle of Villar, um, which, the picture, which is the picture I have on this slide here. Um, and what I argued in my dissertation was that a kind of unwritten contract between king and noble results from this. Um, the nobles, by intervening on the side of the royalists, um, 
essentially acknowledged that they were dependent upon Charles for the perpetuation of their rights and privileges. Charles, meanwhile, allowed a greater degree of Hispanicization in the government. So those Flemish courtiers no longer dominated the place. And so there was a bit of quid pro quo, which meant essentially that the Castilian nobility um, became some of the most cooperative nobles in Europe. Um, like when you compare them with the French or English nobility, who were a constant thorn in the side of whoever was the ruling monarch, you very rarely see that in early modern Spanish history. And I would argue that it's down to this. So to move on, um, the revolt of Hernán Cortés. Um, so many people who are watching this um, might already be familiar with Hernán Cortés. He was the man who conquered Mexico. Um, and his revolt um, was basically a case of runaway imperialism. Uh, he had been given authority by the governor of Cuba, Diego de Velázquez, um, to trade and explore. Uh, and that was, that was all he had the authority to do. But he bent the rules of his contract and settled a town in Mexico called Villa Rica de Veracruz, which still exists today. Um, and he then essentially discarded the authority of Diego Velázquez. So he was absolutely unequivocally a rebel. Um, so this is where the letters of Hernán Cortés, which I mentioned earlier, come in. Cortés wrote these letters to Charles V back in Spain, um, essentially trying to defend himself. And the major thrust of Cortés's argument is that my success speaks for itself. And he also um, defamed the name of Diego Velázquez quite significantly, um, which was necessary because Velázquez was also writing back to Charles, um, telling a very different story. Ultimately, um, Cortes managed to convince Charles of his usefulness uh, and ended up being designated Captain General of New Spain, as it was termed, um, after following the conquest of Mexico in 1521. Ultimately, however, Cortes did fall out of favour with the government because he began to develop a very unstable temperament. Um, he went on this harebrained expedition to Honduras, where he was away for years. There was a civil war in Mexico City in his absence. And after that, the government decided that he couldn't be allowed near power anymore. So those past two revolts that I've discussed, um, they made a very definite impression on administrative reformers who were back in Spain. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about two men here. The first is Grand Chancellor Mercurino de Gatinara and Secretary Francisco de las Cobos, whose photo I have on the right. Um, the monarchy needed to switch up how it had been governing. And Gatinara did this through conciliar reform. So Ferdinand and Isabella, Charles's predecessors on the thrones of Spain, had been fond of governing by council. So Gatinara um, renovated the Council of Castile for governing the home realms. And the Council of Finance was also a creation of his, which was modeled on the existing council in the Netherlands to control the finances of the empire. Um, and the Council of the Indies, which I would argue was the most important, because that was the tool by which the government would manage to maintain control of its colonial possessions and uh, to keep men like Cortes, who obviously had an independent streak, which couldn't be allowed, um, out of power. Francisco de las Cobos, meanwhile, um, is known as the great secretary or one of Spain's great secretaries. Um, and his secretariat, which developed while he was uh, involved with the government, which was quite a long, which is quite a long period of time, um, basically made the council system usable. Um, they would parse through all the information and decide what the king needed to see and what could wait. So everything I've discussed here has had quite a significant effect on Spanish policy. The defeat of the Comuneros secured Charles's authority in Spain, and the revolt of Cortes led to the creation of the Council of Indies, thus asserting Charles's authority in the Americas. And these skilled reformers who I've just mentioned um, managed to equip the Spanish monarchy with the tools it would need for the early modern era. Um, and just as I close, just why, why I think this approach to the topic is valuable. Um, individually, both revolts have been covered quite extensively. Just to give some examples, um, Stephen Hallitzer wrote an excellent book on the revolt of the Comuneros, and J.H. Eliot, who an extremely prolific writer, wrote a chapter in Anthony Pagden's copy of the Letters from Mexico, which uh, informed a lot of the themes of this project. However, my own research examines the two revolts as part of a process, which I've elaborated on already, um, in which I've demonstrated that the kind of chronic instability of the early reign actually led to a stronger regime by the end. 
So a rebellion in the case of the Spanish monarchy actually served to make the regime stronger and driving innovation. So that's all I've got for today. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd like to say thank you to my supervisor, Alistair Malcolm, as well, for all the help he's given me. He's been the perfect supervisor. I couldn't have done it without him. And uh, finally, just a few things that people might be interested in reading. These are books and articles that I found very useful while I was researching. That's all. Thank you.